chair, Bunga. Welcome back. Say hello to the social distancing chair. What's your name here? Um, Soshi. Soshi. This is Soshi. Make sure that we don't get uh, coronavirus. Exactly. This chair is all the protection we need. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is start in your first uh, case study as part of the ecosystems at risk topic. My personal favourite case yeah. study. It's really good, especially if you go there, hey. I heard that some stores <laughs> go there as an excursion. Um, if you are a junior watching this for some reason, some why reason. not? Why well, not? Well, why? I as if you wouldn't. Um, wouldn't. We go in year 11, 12, so if you pick geography, you'll get to come and go scuba diving and snorkeling at the Great Barrier Reef. It's amazing. Keep going, keep going. Uh, I'm going to keep talking because Sizio is just getting tissues. I, um, I spilled some uh, of my water on the thing. So, ecosystem risk just look at our syllabus which is really important you need to know your syllabus you do ecosystem and ecosystem management generally and then you break it down into two case studies okay and the first case study that we're doing with great value reef is super common mm -hmm. across the state really common something like 90% of the students in the state will do it yeah which means you need to nail your statistics you need to know exactly because your markers know exactly how long mm -hmm. it is exactly what latitude can't make up a stat, can't say, oh, how big is the barrier reef? Massive, mate. Okay, well, how massive? Oh, 700,000 <laughs> kilometres cubed? No, you have to know exactly what it is. Exactly. Yeah. So what we're going to be doing today, this video is just an introduction. So looking at what are the key facts we need to know about the reef, um, the, where it is, why it's there, how it formed. Size, extent, continuity, all that sort of All that stuff. Um, a activity I got my year 12 to do recently, and if you're watching from home, be a good one to do, is do a what, when, why, where. What is the Great Barrier Reef? Where is the Great Barrier Reef? When did it get there? Why do we study it? And maybe how is the Great Barrier Reef? Yeah, I want to stick with the W. <laughs> it just messes my head too much. Dad, how has a W in it? No, not the right end. Um, so, the Great Barrier Reef, Sizio. <laughs> what is it? Uh, it's a reef that's just great, and it forms a barrier be between the, right. the ocean and the land. It's the largest coral reef system in the world. <laughs> Has an extent of 2,400 kilometres from north to south, um, starting at uh, 8 degrees south of the equator, um, around the Fly River in Papua New Guinea, and extending down to, I believe, 24 degrees south. Yep. Um, and that is around about where it's good to give a multiple. You know, if you're talking about the location of something, like you can give a specific location or a general location in relation to, say, Sydney, where is Newcastle, or where is Newcastle latitude and longitude wise. So, another way of saying it, not only 24 degrees um, south, it's near like Fraser Island. I was just saying, students, that we kind of as teachers, we like work up for years, right? So in year seven, if we said, where's the Great Barrier Reef? And they said, it's uh, in, in Queensland. We'd be like, yes, yeah, well, done. well done. You know, you get up to year 10, oh, you know, it's um, it's located east of Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, they may give us like a little bit more detail about like how far out from Cairns. Maybe, yeah, maybe between the coast and the continental shelf or something like yeah. that. Yeah, by the time we get to year 11 and 12, we want the latitude. We want to know really specifically where it is, mm -hmm. okay? So it's not good enough anymore just to say it's located in Australia mm -hmm. or it's located off the coast of Queensland. Mm -hmm. You need to chuck in that eight degrees south to 24 degrees south, mm -hmm. um, that latitude and all line, okay? Yeah. Really important. Definitely. Um, it's got a lot of biodiversity and we're oh. gonna have a look in a moment, um, maybe have a chat about our factors of resiliency. Mm. Um, but one, one, of my, one of my favorite things to talk about. Yeah, me too. How they can be both resilient and vulnerable at the same time. Yeah, and we know the Great Barrier Reef is vulnerable because we're studying it as an ecosystem at risk. Mm. So obviously it's vulnerable, there's, but... There's not many more that are more at risk than here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's also resilient in a lot of ways. And one mm. way that it is re super resilient is its biodiversity. So I'm just gonna read off a few facts here. Mm. These are, if you're in our class, these are in your workbooks. You know, got, you got them. 13,000 fish species, 200 bird species, 500 species of seaweed. That's a lot of sushi. 600 species of... Sorry. How do you say that? What? Urchins? Echidnoderms. Echinoderms. Echinoderms? Not echidnoderms. Echidnoderms. <laughs> so, so, water echidnas. Uh, 125 species of shark and rays. Um, and six of the seven sea turtle species. That's that, my favourite. Yeah, that, that's my favourite too. Like, of, of all the fish species in the world, there's only one that doesn't live on the Barrier Reef. Um, there's, yeah. more, there, there's, there's more, there's more, 
I said fish, a lot of fish species. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> total, yeah, total. Totally. Well, it's, it's, it's a total, a kind of fish when you really get down to it. <laughs> Jay's going to cringe about this. <laughs> they live in the water, they're a fish, like dolphins. Anyway, and scuba divers. Um, so, yeah, it, there's, there's much more biodiversity just in the Barrier Reef than in all the rest of the oceans combined, mm. really. The, the Barrier Reef and, and reef systems in general are just like islands of life in an you know, otherwise pretty barren environment. Like the rainforest of the sea. Exactly like and that. In that. The rainforest of the sea is so good. <laughs> in year nine, we talk about net primary production. Mm. And we always talk about, and I always say, you know, which, uh, I go through what net primary production is, which we've done. It's about how much energy is created. And I say, which ecosystem would have the most net primary production? Everyone says rainforest. But it's actually the oceans. Mm. And coral reefs in particular have yeah. the highest, Wi-Fi. yeah, um, highest rate of energy production of any ecosystem in the world. Mm. So it's a weird thing to um, to reflect on that. Like uh, Australia has the most coastline of any of any country, but I believe I'm even in the top fifty in terms of fishing nations, as in the, the amount of fish that we catch. Um, that's because most of our oceans, like most of Australia, are actually desert, like an underwater desert. There's very little life there. But off the West Australian coast, a large portion of that is just pretty much barren and lifeless. But then you get to the Barrier Reef and there's this explosion of life everywhere. The biodiversity is just off the scale. Yeah, so that's like what makes it super um, resilient. It's high biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, another quick fact before we move on quick is fact. that the average depth of the Great Barrier Reef is 35 metres. And this is going to work into what I'm gonna say next, mm -hmm. which is that the reason it's an ecosystem at risk is because it has a very specific set of qualities that it needs. Um, to be able to continue as an ecosystem. Yeah, coral, because of the way they grow, is a very, very complex and interesting interaction, symbiotic relationship between Zuzanthelae. Frozen jelly, Zuzanthelae. Mm. Um, <laughs> and coral polyps, uh, in the way they produce their energy. So they need a very specific, uh, they're very, very highly adapted to mm. the environment that they live in. Um, they need a very, very narrow range of both light exposure and temperature. The light is very, very important because 90% of a coral's energy comes from photosynthesis. I like to think of the Great Barrier Reef as a cat. I'm really liking my analogies today. The Great Barrier Reef is like a cat. If anyone have a cat, you have cats, right? I have two. You will understand. Coco and Megatron. I used to have a cat. Rest in peace, Luna. scratches on my hand because Megatron, Megatron is a jerk. I thought most cats and... Um, Are you saying, wait, 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 controversial take. Are you saying <laughs> the Barrier Reef is a jerk? I'm saying that they can only survive in very specific like, set of conditions, otherwise they're done. And it's the same with cats, right? You can only pat them in a certain spot or they're like done. Oh, they can only live okay. in a certain way or they're just like done with you. So they have to have exactly, things have to be exactly right or they're out and they leave. And that's just like the zoos and belly. If things aren't perfect, you just know exactly how they like it, they're ejected. You have to have what do we have to have? Don't, don't, eject, <laughs> don't eject your cat. The cat will eject itself. Oh. Have you had a cat on your lap and you pat it in a spot that's not its preferred spot and then it just leaves? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can, I can see that. See that. Yeah. Like it might try to bite you. Yeah, whereas my dog, if my dog's on my lap, I could pat it, move it, colour, do whatever, what I want, and it's just like, yeah, okay. okay it's you, resilient. Okay. You, you Am I winning you over? You, I can see <laughs> the angle of your analogy. The barrier reef. It's like a cat. And a rainforest. Miss Coburn, 2020. Uh, okay, so what are the really specific conditions that it needs? A coral reef, not a cat. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's start off with, with sea temperature because it's a massive one and obviously uh, increasing global temperatures is a thing that you might have heard about. Um, so essentially coral can't grow below a temperature of about 18 degrees. It just can't. Um, it's too cold. Um, and anything above 29 degrees for any significant period of time um, tends to be not good at all. So the, the optimal temperature range for coral is even the more in between. 21 so to 27. Yeah, 21 yeah. To 27. so that's what I always get my students to write down, that they yeah. the preferred temperature range. Yeah, so... It can survive, as I said, yeah. a little bit outside mm -hmm. of, of that, but preferably 21 to 27 degrees, yeah. which is like 6 degrees as a range, yeah. and yeah. not a lot. Not, not at all. And 
most of the reef is sort of already in that upper bound. It's closer to the 26, 27 a lot of the time than it is to the, yeah. the 21. So it doesn't take much for that uh, that increase to go above 27 in, in the danger zone of red sea. If it gets above 29, that can be very, very big problems very quickly. And that's when we start to see like bleaching occurring and um, <laughs> sorry, something's going on upstairs. Yeah. Um, really interesting because I think a lot of people have like preconceived ideas and a lot of people when they come into a Great Barrier Reef already know about the reef. So like, it's not as if we're teaching you fresh. When coral is bleached, it doesn't actually mean that it's dead. Mm. So if coral experience a bleaching period, they can actually bounce back. Yeah, they can um, re recollect their yeah. accidentally. Yeah, absolutely. So there is a level of resilience and malleability in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's oh, when mal malleability. What does that mean? Malleability is the rate at which an ecosystem is able to bounce back after a natural or human-induced stress. I agree. That's great. <laughs> I'm glad because it's a fact. <laughs> um, if we have a couple of bleaching episodes in a row, so it, it always happens in summer, to so say we have a bleaching episode in the well, 2015, 2016, summer was particularly bad, and then we have another, and then maybe it regrows, and we have another one the next year, and then another one, that's when the coral is actually going to die. Mm. So it can it can withstand a bleaching episode, it's continual episodes of bleaching yeah. that cause it to die. And, and uh, largely, there's been a bleaching event, naturally, it happens. Not unfrequently, maybe once a decade you get a, a bleach bleaching event. Um, we've now we're having one literally right now in 2020. Mm -hmm. We also had one in 2017, and we had a massive one in 2016. Yeah. So this once a decade thing has now happened three times since 2016. Yeah. Once. And in 2015 to 2016, the reason we say 15 to 16 is because it's that summer period. Yeah, so yeah. um, 50 percent of the reef was bleached yeah. in 2015, 2016 mm -hmm. summer. Basically, anything north of about. About halfway between Townsville and Cairns, all the way north, well, in the, obviously further north, the warmer is. That whole north section of the reef was was significantly bleached. Um, so, what happens mm. when bleaching occurs? So, um, zooxanthellae, the, the algae that is um, essentially inside of the coral, it's, it's sort of consumed but then put into the, the outer layer of the coral polyp um, to which is a really cool symbiotic trick trick for the um, polyp to get some more energy. Um, it, uh, the, if the polyp gets too warm, it's almost like a panic sort of defense mechanism, it excretes its um, zooxanthellae, its algae, out into the water again. And because the zooxanthellae is what gives the coral its color, all those amazing colors that you see in photos of barrier reef, when that algae is ex expelled, therefore goes anything that, that causes the coral to have color, so it turns a bright white. Now this is a big problem, as I said a minute ago, because 90% on average, different corals, different rates, but about 90% of the energy that a coral, a coral uses is a, from a photosynthesis energy from the sun. So all of a sudden, as soon as that uh, algae is expressed, the coral is now down 90% of its energy or of its food source. So obviously if you cut your diet by 90% all at once, then you'd have significant health consequences too in the long run. A uh, really cool video that uh, we found recently, and mm. if you're one of our students, we put it up already, but just go to YouTube and just YouTube um, Coral Expel Susan Felly or mm. Coral Bleaching in Action. Put Coral Bleaching in Action in, and it's a National Geographic video. It goes for about a minute, two minutes, and it actually shows a coral expelling the Susan Felly, and you can see it in real time yeah. um, as it's being bleached. Yeah, it's, really it, 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 it's a pretty rapid thing, actually. Yeah. Like bleaching events can happen over a number. It's the bell. Period two. Remember Go to bells? your next lesson. Remember the bell? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it actually happens really quick. So you can have a uh, a whole reef of coral that's completely fine, and then a week later, it's all bleached. It, it's super fast. Even over, over the period of days, you have a pretty big bleaching event. Yeah. So, um, looking at this like idea of temperature, and we're going to come back to this. Our next video is going to be about biophysical interactions, mm -hmm. and when we get to geomorphic processes, we're going to this in a bit more detail. Um, but the Great Barrier Reef would not exist how it exists today 
if it wasn't for the fact that Australia had drifted northwards into warm tropical waters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Australia's been drifting northwards for 160 million years. It used to be attached to Antarctica. It it's did. Pretty cold. Yeah, so if you, and if you want to look at that more, go, again, go into Google and Google um, Australia plate tectonics, and you can see we used to be really far south and in cold waters where we never could have had a tropical coral reef. This part of the Great Australian Bight, that bit used to be completely attached to like, uh, uh, Antarctica, it used to like fit straight in there. So then we started to drift north, and it was this movement of the tectonic plates, this drifting northwards, that allowed the Great Barrier Reef to develop. Yeah, because for much of the last hundred million years, Australia was just in an area way too cold to for for reef, reef growth to occur. Um, okay, so that's one thing, temperature. Mm -hmm. A second thing that the Great Barrier Reef must have, and this is a very interesting one, is water depth. Um, very, again, very specific. It's not like it has to be a certain depth. It has to be, it can't be too shallow or too deep. Like it's, it's either way is very, very bad. Yeah. Right. So almost all uh, coral grows between four meters and 30 meters of depth. Um, it can't be out of the water exposed to the elements and, and, and all, as well as too much light. But uh, after about 30 meters, it, there's not enough light penetration through the water to, for the photosynthesis to happen from the zooxanthellae. So therefore, you, you find almost all of your coral between that four and 30 meters zone. So one other problem is contributing to the vulnerability of the reef. It's sort of a second pronged thing from the um, global temperature increase is as global temperatures increase and ice melts, particularly in Greenland and um, uh, the North Pole, the Arctic region, um, well, more so Antarctic region, because that's water being added to the oceans rather than ice, water ice, so it's not really increasing the depth. As sea levels rise, light has to penetrate further to get to the coral for the coral to photosynthesize, which can pretty significantly impact, especially in the deeper um, areas, can impact the life of the coral and, and mean it can't get enough sunlight to, to... Yeah, so on that, and like, I guess this is a third one, but it really works into that one as well, is water quality. Mm -hmm. So um, we know that if it gets too deep, the coral can't photosynthesize. But again, the same thing happens if the water is too murky or has mm -hmm. too high a turbidity. Turbidity, I love that word. Uh, the, uh, we can't photosynthesize, they can't photosynthesize even, mm -hmm. so sunlight won't get through. So that's another factor. They have to have clear, yeah. clear water. Well, we'll get to management strategies later on, but one of the, the things about the, the rules around the Barrier Reef that the, um, the Australian government, the Queensland government has put in place is restrictions around farming on rivers that flow into the ocean where the Barrier Reef is because you do a lot of land clearing and there's a lot of runoff from farms and stuff like that, a lot of silt and, and dirt and fertilizers and stuff to get into the water. That flows directly out into the reef and increases the turbidity, which can seriously impact on the reef health. So there's a lot of rules about what you can and can't do around rivers, all you know, basically from you know, the half or two thirds of the Queensland coast, you have significant rules around what you can do on rivers. And that sediment can lead to like really severe algal blooms where algae mm -hmm. sits on top of the water and physically stops sunlight being able to penetrate through to um, the coral reefs. Yeah. And takes we'll, a lot of oxygen out of the water too. Yeah, we'll, take, we'll, we'll look at this later in the course because a really good case study of when this happens during like a flooding event where yeah. heaps of sediment got washed out into the Great Barrier Reef and um, had a big impact. Yeah, there's also one again that this is why climate change is such a multi pronged problem. Um, increased carbon in the atmosphere, um, a lot of that carbon will be essentially soaked up by the ocean, which when you combine um, carbon dioxide with seawater, it turns the seawater more acidic. Um, so you basically end up with a more higher acid content, um, high, high, is it higher or lower pH? Carbonic acid. Carbonic yeah. acid, yeah. Is it high pH is above seven is acid and below seven is alkaline? Alkaline, is that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the more, the more acidic the ocean, it actually starts to dissolve away at the outer um, shell of the coral that they that make to protect themselves. The, um, yeah. the calcium carbonate sort of um, exoskeleton structures of the coral basically start to get dissolved. And we'll talk about that when we get to like geomorphic processes in our biophysical interaction. So if if you just heard that and you're like, oh, like I, don't, I need to know more about that, next video um, we're going to go into that into more detail again. Yeah. Um, so there's some of the things that they, the Great Barrier Reef needs. Is there anything I've missed? I'm just trying to think through from temperature, depth, uh, water quality, water quality. Um, yeah. So it just shows again all of those factors 
um, we're, we're being leaning towards the things that make it vulnerable because oh well, yeah is, let's go through that yeah it is, it is so so finely tuned to what like to one specific range of temperature light levels and stuff like that that um, the ways that it is vulnerable in terms of temperature for example it'd be a big problem because temperature is a thing ocean temperatures can increase the entire length of the reef all at once through climate change and stuff like that whereas the reef is so big see that's behind this one north and south um, that is usually a very good you know, big factor in its resilience um, so when a cyclone like tropical cyclone Yazzie in 2011 comes through that had a pretty devastating impact on the reef around Cairns but the reef is so big that that's only one sort of even a, a few you know hundred kilometers of reef getting damaged by the cyclone is still a small part of this big reef system so it makes it it makes it resilient in the size but the ocean increasing in temperature everywhere mm -hmm. negates the resilience of it being so big so the, these factors that we've talked about really lead into the vulnerability and resilience of the, of the reef speaking of which let's go through them okay i love vulnerability and resilience oh, um so we talked about biodiversity already so we know higher biodiversity means um greater resilience mm -hmm. so do we want to just sit on that for a minute and, and like focus on why high biodiversity yeah. means resilience. Okay. Yeah. All right. You want me to go? Oh no, yeah, no, I'm like, oh, yeah. go, go for oh, it. So, so it's one thing to say that, well, like, if you get asked in a question, what makes the barrier reef either resilient or vulnerable, you can say, well, it, its extent makes it resilient and its biodiversity make it resilient. Okay, but you have to explain why and say why that is. I kind of already touched on the size and the extent. But why would high biodiversity make it more resilient? This essentially comes down to links in food webs, and our year 12s will recognise these as the trophic levels. Yeah, how many species exist at each trophic level, and how many links are there between each of the levels in the food web? So you've got the primary producers, the plants and stuff like that, and algae and stuff. Um, uh, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. What that is, that is, that is, that. So if you have hundreds of species on each trophic level if one species from each level were to go extinct there's just so many other things that can still you know take its place and the big fish can't eat this little fish anymore but there's a dozen other types of little fish they can eat instead and that's fine when you have very few links in the food web or, or even if you think of a single food chain if that thing eats that thing eats that thing and eats that thing if you take out that species from the bottom the whole thing collapses so the more linkages you have between trophic levels, because there's a lot of species there, the more resilient the ecosystem will be. Yeah. So there's um, four factors we look at for vulnerability and resilience. We've kind of covered two there, so like biodiversity yeah. and linkages, because they go hand in hand. So the, the greater biodiversity, the more linkages there's going to be um, in a food web. Mm -hmm. When we look at biodiversity as well, we also look at like species diversity um, and... Uh, by, uh, genetic diversity. Genetic diversity, that's the word I was looking for. Sorry. Sorry. Right. Oh, so I'm here. We work as a team. <laughs> um, but we've made a whole video about that. So if you yeah. want to go back, uh, I think we've talked about it like twice actually mm -hmm. in quite detail. So if you want to go back and look at genetic diversity and species diversity, go back to our video. Um, I might even put a linky thing in here about um, vulnerability and resilience because we did a whole thing on yeah. that. So linkages, biodiversity done. Extent is pretty much done as well. Large extent, large. Um, Resilience, mm -hmm. and then the last one is location. Mm -hmm. And there's a few factors that like come into play here, and it's kind of weird because one, well, I guess both. Yeah, both of the locational factors make it quite vulnerable. Mm -hmm. The first locational factor is the fact that it's really close to humans. Yeah. And again, we talked about um, location in general in that last yeah. video, but this is sort of specific to the reef now. So yeah, you go well. I've already heard this. No, you haven't. We're talking specifically. Yeah. yeah so we know that the reef is a huge source of tourism, um, and we have. Heaps of people visiting a reef, going out, going scuba diving, boating, snorkeling. They used to do something called reef walking, which is where terrible idea. <laughs> terrible idea. For, the reef. for so many reasons, a terrible idea. And uh, they figured out 
recently, that's not a good idea, so they don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But that has a huge impact, okay? If you have a um, ecosystem that's super isolated, like we looked at the Tasmanian forests that some parts haven't even been touched, mm -hmm. that's gonna make it resilient because it doesn't have all of those human-induced stresses. Yeah. Um, the Great Barrier Reef has every human-induced stress you could possibly imagine. Yeah, it was so clear, like, like I said, it's, it contributes massively to the economy of Queensland because there's so many people from all around the world that are there all the time. So they have managed this in ways like they've sectioned off a lot of reefs. Um, like the majority of the reef is not open to tourism, but a lot of the reef is. And there's a, in those small areas where they do allow tourism, there's a lot of tourism. Like when we went, when we went out on our mm. excursion last year, did I mention that when you take your 12 and your 11, <laughs> anyway. Um, when we were going out from Cairns, I remember the first afternoon we arrived in Cairns and we sort of went for a walk down to the beach. Um, we just saw, remember seeing all those boats yeah. coming back in, like just boat after boat after boat after boat. And we didn't go in all peak season people. either. Yeah, we were, we were outside winter. of peak. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there was just dozens and dozens of really large boats packed with people. Yeah. We were like about 4.35 in the afternoon that had been on the reef most mm. of the day, just one after the other, like, yeah, it's like a traffic jam in, in, but for boats instead of cars, it's crazy. Um, another uh, reason location makes the Barrier Reef vulnerable too is uh, it's in the tropics. And tropics off the coastline, therefore perfect conditions or perfect area that you're going to get a lot of um, cyclone activity. Oh yeah, three. Yeah. That wasn't the one I was going to say. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so obviously, if like it's a bit of a you know, double-edged sword, if you're not in a tropical area, tropical area, the water won't be warm enough for coral to grow, um, which means you're always having reefs in, reefs in tropical areas, and therefore a lot of those tropical areas are going to be uh, susceptible to cyclone activity. Um, the Australian coast just so happens to be, you know, um, uh, latitude-wise, especially around you know, Cairns, the Townsville area, uh, it, well, pretty much anywhere from, from Townsville north, uh, you get pretty big cyclones every, every few years, you get a massive one. Um, there's actually been one of the predicted uh, impacts of climate change um, over the next, uh, I think I saw stats out of 2080, um, is a significant increase in level four um, category cyclones. Yeah. So trop tropical cyclone Yazzie was probably the biggest one in about the last 30 years. It was a tropical, uh, it was a category five and it caused massive impacts to the reef and Queensland in general, made everyone banana climb and go up to like a whole bunch of banana plantations. But that is part and parcel with where, where the reef is. So it's location, not only it's close to the coast and therefore and close to centers of tourism um, and therefore people, um, it's, it, it's a prime location for it to be impacted by cyclone activity. And the impacts of those cyclones, and we'll look at this when we get to biophysical, but the impacts of those cyclones are huge. There's so many different impacts. You've got your mechanical weathering from bits of coral that are broken off, bombies, mm -hmm. not bombies. Um, but you've also got that sediment flow that comes through when areas are flooded that we talked about earlier. So there's, there's a huge range of impacts that come from that cyclonic activity, and we'll look at that when we get to weather and climate in a bit more detail. Yeah. Um, um, just an interesting point, mm -hmm. just kind of because we asked um, our doing online teaching, um, uh, did some skills work, and I, I chucked in a question through the week about, I, I showed a graph of tropical cyclone Yazzie's path mm -hmm. as it came from the north, east to southwest direction and across the Queensland coast and it was sort of just pretty much exactly between Cairns and Townsville or sort of just across the coast and I had a graph of coral damage um, caused by that cyclone and the coral damage to the south of the cyclone path was significantly worse mm. than north of the cyclone path and one of the questions I asked in my year 12 if you haven't done this by the way year 12 I'm going to give you the answer um, was why is the coral damage so much worse south of the tornado or the cyclone path than north of the tornado path? Do you, should I keep going? Or do yeah, you give me the answer. Okay. So um, as cyclone comes in, quick question for you out there: Which direction does airflow around a cyclone in the southern hemisphere? Correct. It is clockwise. Well done. I'm hoping that's, it, like, that's clockwise for, for me, but I don't know if it's clockwise for them, so yeah. I could have just thrown them off. <laughs> so as the cyclone moves towards the coast, 
it's spinning clockwise, which means the south of the cyclone path is getting essentially onshore winds and is affecting the open ocean and therefore causing a lot of wave activity. Whereas the, the wind to the north is from the shore and doesn't have as much ocean to really impact on. So the south, the, uh, south of the cyclone path was generating huge swells, huge waves that had a massive hydraulic impact on the coral. Mechanical weathering. Yeah, and then smashed and broke a bunch of coral. Yeah, the and bombies. The bombies. And I don't know why I liked that so much. Then. Yeah, for between 100 kilometers uh, south of the cyclone path, you had more than 50% of the reef suffered catastrophic um, coral damage, almost total in some places. Fun fact, I was born during a cyclone. Really? In Townsville. I didn't know there were cyclones in Adelaide. Townsville, I was born in Townsville. In Adelaide, technically. Um, locational factor number three. Three. There was two, now yeah. we've got three. Yeah. Um, the conditions, again, we're going back to conditions and the cat analogy, is very highly specialised. Really high salt, really warm waters, which means the um, species that are able to survive there are highly specialised as well. Which means any slight change to those really highly specialised conditions is going to lead to um, huge impacts across the entire ecosystem. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So we had uh, what, what other um, in, uh, things that make it vulnerable to resilient? Specialisation vulnerable. Cool. Okay. That'll I think we call it there because this video has now gotten into the 20s. Don't pretend you don't like it. Um, so that's it for our introduction to Great Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. I recommend always, um, and be careful with this, I'm going to recommend it, but <laughs> hold on, not completely recommend it. I'm looking right. forward to this. I don't know what it is, but I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Write out an introduction for the Great Barrier Reef. Make sure all your stats are in there, that you've got your location, your extent, all of that. However... Do not go into the HSC with, I've written my intro and I'm just going to rewrite that introduction. Yeah, because you need, no, you need to make the introduction specific to the question. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't practice one. Go back, okay? I have students all the time email me and say, hey, can you give me an essay question? You don't need to, like, I'm more than happy to. But go to past HSC exams, they're all there. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be much quicker than emailing me and waiting to get a response. So, go find one about... And um, not that, you can find, you'll find not only, especially from 2011 onwards, You'll find the question, but you'll also find example like yeah. answers and the marking criteria. Yeah. There's nothing better. So go back and find one um, and just do the introduction and focus on getting all of those important statistics in there about the biodiversity, the extent, the location, well, and answering the question. I know we started on this and we've mentioned it a couple of times, but you have to have multiple and correct statistics for the reef. If yeah. you put in a statistic because you can't remember exactly what it is and you make it up, your marker in the HSC will recognise immediately that that is a false stat. That will cost you marks. You have to, have to, have to, have to know your stats. Yeah. And one last thing before we go, um, um, we've probably said this a thousand times, but a thousand and one won't hurt. The question is not going to say... Explain the impacts on the Great Barrier Reef. Yes. So explain the impacts on an, an ecosystem, ecosystem at risk or an ecosystem you have studied. You have studied yeah, yeah. Um, or on ecosystems, mm, it's in plural, you have studied, in which case you need to do two. Okay, the second sorry. one we're going to be doing is intertidal wetland, but right. that may be different. For your school, you may do rainforest, you may do sand dunes. Yeah, the, the intertidal wetland is actually it's opposite the Barrier Reef. Almost everyone does a reef, almost no one. Well, there's it's not, not, as not many people do, yeah. do intertidal. Um, a lot of, if you're watching this from another school around the state, um, what normally is the case is a lot of schools will do barrier reef and an ecosystem that is relatively close to where your school is. Yeah, rainforests are real popular. And yeah. the, in the excursion, we wanted one of the options was to do a day at that ecosystem, yeah. which we didn't do because we weren't studying it. Um, if you're in another school, um, comment down below because I'd actually really like to hear what ecosystems you do. Yeah, are you doing a great barrier reef? Yeah. What else are you doing with it? I know um, a lot of schools in the south of the state do alpine. Yeah, alpine well. oh, that'd be fun. It's pretty good. Yeah, I know a lot of the schools around the southern islands, Goulburn and stuff like that. Shout out to everyone in Goulburn. Um, they do uh, uh, a lot of, uh, well, they focus on alpine. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about brumbies in the the, uh, the high snowy mountains. And stuff pests. Like so, but they're nice pests. But they're pests. Okay, <laughs> signing off. See you later, GS Squad. We'll be back soon.